to call the meeting to order, please. <coughs> Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Can I have a roll call, please? Present. Council Langevin? Present. Council Marcucci? Present. Council Moriarty? Present. Council McDonald? Present. Council Nicola? Present. Council Pelequin? Present. Council Regis? Council Vandal? Present. Eight here? Thank you. Agenda item number three consider and accept town council meeting minutes of Monday, August 27th, 2012. So moved. Can I have a roll call, please? Council Langevin? Yes. Council Marcucci? Yes. Council Moriarty? Pre yep. Yes. Council McDonald? Yes. Council Nicola? Yes. Council Pelequin? Yes. Council Vandal? Yes. Council Clements? Yes. Eight yes. Thank you. Agenda item number four, subcommittee reports, a general government, and that would be Councilor Regis. I will read the minutes. A meeting of the General Government Subcommittee was held on Wednesday, September 5th in the Rice Conference Room. In attendance were Chairwoman Regis, Committee Members Councillor Langevin, Councillor Pelequin, Citizen Members Larry Spinelli. Also in attendance were Councillor Nicola, Councillor Moriarty, Councillor Marcucci, Town Manager Clark, Michael Janes, and Gus Steves. Chairwoman Regis called the meeting to order at 7 o'clock. Agenda item number one, discuss memorandum to municipal clients regarding open meeting law, remote participation, and present to town council to adopt as part of municipality-wide policy. Councilor Nicola stated that, I br that she brought this item agen agenda item to the subcommittee because I was approached by members of other committees, not by the town council. In order for other committees and boards to be able to do remote participation, it has to be adopted by the town council. Mr. Clark handed out the policy statement with the guidelines laid out by the state under Massachusetts Open Meeting Law 940 CMR 29, Section 29.10, Remote Participation. Mr. Clark reviewed the criteria as outlined by the state. Some of the participation rules include, one, there must be a physical presence of the majority in order to have a quorum. Two, reasons for remote participation have to be personal illness, personal disability, emergency, military service, geographic distance. Three, all votes must be done by roll call. Mr. Clark said that if remote participation is adopted, the regulations must be followed by all boards and committees with no deviations. Discussion was held on the different scenarios that can develop with the use of remote participation. After discussion, no action will be taken. A motion to adjourn was made by Councillor Langevin and seconded by Larry Spinelli. Vote by a show of hands. All in favor, four to nothing. Meeting adjourned at 7.45 p.m. Respectfully submitted Evelyn Rivera, recording clerk. B, DPW subcommittee, Councillor Vandal. Um, no report, no meeting scheduled. Thank you. C, Education and Human Services, and that is Councillor Marcucci. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry. Education and Human Services Subcommittee was held on Tuesday, August 28, 2012, in the Rice Conference Room. Uh, in attendance were Chairwoman Marcucci, committee members, uh, Councillor Moriarty. Also in attendance were Councillor Nicola, Councillor Pelequin, Karen Hanois, Martina Shea, and Kevin Buxton. Chairwoman Marcucci called the meeting to order at 7.05 p.m. Agenda item number one, discuss and vote to appoint Martina Shea of Southbridge to the Education and Human Services Subcommittee for a one-year period, effective August 1st, 2012 through July 31st, 2013. Ms. Shea expressed her interest to become a member as she is a retired school teacher who has taught for many years and would like to be a voice for education and trash issues. Councillor Makuchi stated she is happy to have her on the committee and likes her education experience and appreciates her stepping forward and volunteering her time. A motion was made by Councillor Moriarty, seconded by Councillor Nicola, with a favorable recommendation to Council 
to appoint Martina Shea of Southbridge to the Education and Human Services Subcommittee for a one-year period effective August 1, 2012 through July 31, 2013. Vote by a show of hands, all in favor, three to zero. Agenda item number two, discuss and vote to appoint Holly Christo of Southbridge to the EHS Subcommittee for a one-year period effective August 1, 2012 through July 31, 2013. Councilor Nicola stated Holly has been on this subcommittee in the past and has been very interested in the education piece as well as everything else and thinks she will continue to serve well. A motion was made by Councilor Moriarty, seconded by Councilor Nicola with a favorable recommendation to Council to appoint Holly Christo of Southbridge to the EHS subcommittee for a one-year period effective August 1, 2012 through July 31, 2013. Vote by a show of hands, all in favor 3-0. Agenda item number three, discuss and vote to approve the Casella payment of $72,000 from the Recycle Bank transition account to continue to be used for further education and enforcement for the trash recycling program as outlined in, memo, in the memo from James Morin dated 8-13-12. Karen Hanoi stated there were balances from the 2011 money including $8,500 available for solid waste enforcement and $689 in overtime account and materials. Ms. Hanoi stated this is to continue the program with $36,000 for solid waste enforcement, that being Green Brown Consulting, $22,000 for salaries enforcement, and $14,000 for material supplies and advertising. Councilor Pelliquin stated there is nothing else out there and she will not support it this year. Councilor Moriarty stated bylaws should be enforced and he disagrees with portions of the bylaw. Councilor Nicola stated they looked at other options and this was the last one offered to them and believes it's working. She added that people are getting used to the new program and the town looks better and recycling numbers are going up. Kevin Buxton handed out copies of Exhibit H from the curbside collection program and referred to <coughs> Section 2-8 Uncollectible Refuse. Mr. Buxton stated the hollers should be labeled the trash with the tag and does not want to see the town over policing to interfere with the curbside pickup. He expressed concern for grabbing indirect costs out of the recycle bank money. Mr. Buxton stated they need to review the scope of service and would like to see us process our own recycling in town. Councilor Nicola explained the decision to not use the current staff from Casella to label refuse was made from the previous town manager. Councilor Nicola stated the bylaw review committee is reviewing the bylaw and that this contract is up and it is time to do it again. Mr. Buxton asked that SRD and questioned uh, section 5.11 about bidding. Councilor Moriarty stated he recalled SRD was a subsidiary of Casella. Mr. Buxton stated he doesn't feel the 72,000 should be subsidized what Casella should be doing as they are in charge of the scope of service. Councilor Nicola stated she was curious about SRD revenues but doesn't think it's enough of a draw for them. Mr. Buxton express, expressed interest in using the 22000 towards a recycling rewards program. Further discussion was held that the money has also been used for education and enforcement and the prior incentive program was not successful. Mr. Buxton stated there is a lot of further information that uh, could be gathered and recommended as it is discussed before going to the town council. A motion was made by Councilor Nicola and seconded by Councilor Moriarty with a favorable recommendation to Council to approve the Casella payments of $72,000 from the Recycle Bank transition account to continue to be used for further education and enforcement for the trash recycling program as outlined in, mem in the memo from James Morin dated 8 13 12. Vote by a show of hands, all in favor, 3-0. A motion to adjourn was made by Councilor Moriarty, seconded by Councilor Nicola. Vote by a show of hands, all in favor, 3-0. Meeting was adjourned, 7.46 p.m. Uh, respectfully submitted, Stacy Reno, recording clerk. And Madam Chair, I have no uh, meeting scheduled at this time. Thank you. Thank you. D, Planning and Development, Councilor Clements. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no meeting minutes this evening. We did have a meeting this evening, uh, this evening at six o'clock, and we will have those minutes at the next meeting to read. And uh, there are no meetings scheduled currently. Thank you. <laughs> e protection of persons and property, uh, Councillor Langevin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no report and no meeting scheduled at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number five, Chairwoman's announcements. It's me. Um, I have a few.
last week, the town of Southbridge lost another member, a former police officer by the name of Wilfred Matteris, also known as Tarky Matteris. His, he is the father to retired police officer Greg Matteris. And I'm told that his father was also a police officer in this town. Um, I'd like to take a moment of silence, if I may. Thank you. This November, when we have the general election, one, of, one item that will not be included on the ballot is the town charter changes. Um, I had been under the impression that it had done everything it needed to do in Boston, but unfortunately, once it passed the legislature, it was only placed on the governor's desk to sign on September 6th, and he has 10 days to act on this. It will not make it to the November ballot as the deadlines for add-ons will have passed, and this information was provided to me by our town clerk. So if you're looking for that on the ballot in November, it won't be there. It will have to be later on. I've also been asked to advise you that the last date to register to vote for the special Bay Path election, which will take place on October 4th, will be the last day will be on Friday, September 14th, and the town clerk's office will be open on that Friday until 8 o'clock. Um, the last thing that I have, well, actually, it's not the last thing, sorry, I've got a few things. I'm going to wait on that. We received through the town manager's office, a letter from the United Nations Association of Greater Boston. And it reads, every day, the United Nations and its family of agencies work to improve people's lives throughout the world through peace building, environmental sustainability, emergency relief, human rights, and global health work. We invite you to join us this year in recognizing the important work of the UN on October 24, 2012, the 67th anniversary of the United Nations. Since 1947, every U.S. president, beginning with Harry Truman, has issued a proclamation asking citizens to observe this special occasion. This year's celebration focuses on the topic, the United Nations Solutions for a Prosper Prosperous World. We hope you will recognize October 24, 2012 as United Nations Day and ask other interested individuals, groups, or schools in your community to participate in UN Day activities. And they list a, a, a bunch of different suggestions, issue a UN Day proclamation, um, fly the United Nations flag, encourage educators to conduct model UN simulations, encourage libraries to show displays on United Nations. For our part, there is a proclamation here. Sorry. I'm going to read the proclamation and I'm going to ask the manager to see that in your office if we can't put this together. I, we will be having a town council meeting as, as it is on October 24th, so at that time, I'm actually not going to read it now. I, I, um, I think I'll wait, and at that time we will read the proclamation and um, have the council sign it. But I wanted to bring it up today and ask the manager if you could see to it that that, that does happen. Thank you very much. Here it is. All right. I'm going to move on at this moment to the town manager's announcements. Thank you, Madam Mr. Chair. Clark. I do have uh, several items to uh, report this evening. Uh, the first is that we did conduct a uh, sale of three lots on Commercial Drive 
uh, the proponent came in and was able to bid in an amount that was consistent with the RFP. Uh, the town netted out $107,000 for 107,000 for the uh, the three lots. And unfortunately, or fortunately, we had to um, pay for mass development, did the study for that area, a uh, feasibility study. So we have paid that bill consistent with that contract of $26,000. I most likely will follow up um, fairly quickly here and see if we can get another RFP out to see if we can get the other lot sold. I may wait for the ground to be broken for them to start actually doing construction. I think that will have a, a better impact for us. On several legal notices and just activities uh, for, we have a tree removal hearing. Uh, the hearing is gonna be Friday, September 4th at 9 a.m. in front of 243 Torrey Road, Southbridge, Mass. Uh, regarding the removal of the following marked trees along Torrey Road in preparation for road reconstruction. Uh, uh, several of the trees are at, in front of 243 Torrey, and then there's also one that's in front of 314 Torrey and across from 366 Torrey. Uh, the hearing is done in accordance with the Mass Public Shade Tree Law. All persons concerned are invited to attend the hearing. That's September 14th at 9 a.m. in front of 243 Torrey Road. And that is a prelude to the plans that have been done for the reconstruction of Torrey Road, and that work is anticipated to be done uh, later in the fall. The section of Torrey Road that I'm referring to is the section from the new school driveway up to the town line in Charlton. We did receive also material from uh, Casella that they have another household hazardous waste Collection day, that is gonna be Saturday, September 29th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. up at the Barefoot Road facility. Also from uh, Whitewater, we will be doing the semi-annual hydrant flushing. Uh, the Southridge Water Department will start its semi-annual hydrant flushing program on Monday, September 10th, today at approximately 7 a.m. and continue daily for approximately four to six weeks between the hours of 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. Flushing will start in the Westville area and continue easterly throughout the town. The procedure will include the cleaning of reservoir intake screens, flushing accumulated sediments from water mains, and testing the operation of each hydrant. Uh, residents are cautioned that they should check the water before doing any um, laundry as it could lead to some discoloration. And you can check it by just turning on the tap and and looking at it. We did also receive uh, in our in the mail, uh, I think a little bit just before, actually while I was gone, a, uh, an opinion from the attorney, uh, uh, the Office of the Attorney General in regards to an open meeting law complaint. This was in regards to uh, meetings that were held on September 12th. Uh, the, the question was the validity of the executive session. I'm just, the conclusion is fairly brief, so I might just read it. For reasons stated above, we find that the council did not violate the open meeting law by discussing matters related to Fenwick Bynema in executive session on September 12th, 2011, or by granting Fenwick Bynema the rights guaranteed by executive session purpose one in connection with that meeting. We do find that the meeting notice for September 12th, 2011 meeting and the verbal statement preceding the council's vote to enter into executive session on that date were not sufficiently uh, were not sufficiently specific to advise the public of the issues to discuss during that executive session. Accordingly, we order immediate and future compliance with the open meeting law and caution that future similar violations may be considered evidence of the intent to violate the law. So I think overall, uh, that's a good, a good report for the town, but as always, I think we need to try to be as specific as we can when we go into uh, executive session. On National Grid, they're gonna be doing some uh, work. <clears throat> this is the, uh, the natural gas side of National Grid. They're gonna be uh, doing some replacement work up at uh, the neighborhood of one to 82 Hartwell Street and 199 to 206 Chapin Street. Uh, the work has a tentative start date of today with an approximate end date of September 24th. So if you do have any uh, issues in that area, just be advised that they will be doing some new main work in that vicinity. 
And then just on the uh, North Woodstock Road project, I know uh, at one of the subcommittee meetings I was asked to kind of check on two things. One was the uh, North Woodstock Road project has, uh, for all intents and purposes, stopped. Uh, they did ran, run into uh, contaminated soil issues. So those issues will have to be resolved before the bulk of the work continues. Uh, so contaminated soil is the reason why that that project has stopped. At this point, too, it's anticipated that the uh, that costs will be um, borne by the state, not necessarily by the town. But just um, not great news. Uh, the second one is I did go up to the uh, state pool on Friday, and they were working away. Uh, they do have it's still a work in progress, um, and I wasn't able. We put in a call to the uh, gentleman from the state. We have not received a return, return phone call yet, but that work is progressing, and there was activity up at the pool. Unfortunately, I had kind of a tight time window, so I didn't get a chance to talk to the workers to see what the status was. But they had about two crews out there working on it. <clears throat> and then the, the last item I have is that we probably almost, almost a year ago, we were uh, requested as a town from a law firm out in Missouri to participate in um, a damage settlement claim against the um, Com, I'm sorry, against the U.S. government in regards to the railroad and some of the easements that the town had. Um, in my absence, Karen Harnoy's attended that meeting. It does appear that there is some settlement discussions and that the town may receive uh, some payments for the easements that were inappropriately taken by the federal government when they acquired the railroad from the railroad. Um, that is something that is in the works. We don't have yet a timeline for when we may receive the money. And just in terms of order of magnitude, we're talking about around approximately $20,000. So I thought that that's uh, somewhat good news, but we may have to wait to see what the, uh, the final outcome is going to be. And that concludes my comments this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Agenda item um, seven this evening is some presentations. Um, the first being the bicentennial celebration. And that would be Steve Brady and Fred Morin. Madam Chair, Councilors, Town Manager. First, let me say that I had the privilege and honor to play ball with Taki Madras for years and I consider him one of the best ball players that come out of South Bridge in the last 60, 70 years to my knowledge. And not only that, but he was a gentleman and his whole family were in the police uh, department and we're gonna miss him, believe me. <clears throat> the two historical committees in town last spring got together to start formulating some kind of uh, plans for the bicennial. <clears throat> We feel that uh, we're at the point now where we need your endorsement to this committee for us to proceed. And uh, uh, Scott Brady will show you uh, what we've been planning and working on for the last four or five months. Thank you. Scott? Scott's my other name. You play, foot, you play football next week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Fred. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I just wanted to let you, you know, let everyone know Fred's already done the introduction, and uh, a big event is coming up in less than four years, a bicentennial. And I'm sure we could all remember, well, many of us can remember the nation's bicentennial. It's a big event. It's a milestone in, in, a, in the history of a town, a state, a, a government, a country. And so what we've been bantering back and forth between the Southbridge Historical Society and the S Southbridge Historical Commission about what to do about this, how we should organize ourselves, what's the right approach. Approach town uh, council and the town government here to let it, everyone know what's going on and where we're coming. Now, I want to just emphasize one thing other than what Fred said. It's the Historical Commission Society and uh, Councillor Moriarty has also shown some interest. He's actually come to some of our meetings and so he's helped a lot with getting things together. So as you can see, um, he, 
the slide presentation that was put together, actually Sean did most of the work on this. So, so anyway, uh, going forward, as you can see, the bicentennial is coming up in 2016. And I uh, want to give a little bit of a history of the town, because the first settler to the town was James Dennison back in 17, early 1730s, about 1732. And uh, when he came to this town, uh, he basically lived in, in a rock. It's basically a rock outcrop. It's off of Mark Ave, for those who know where it is. Um, but as the town developed and progressed from 1732, it actually became, it was part of Sturbridge, Charlton, and Dudley. And around 18, 1800, 1795 actually, the town, the people who lived in this town wanted to separate from the other towns because it was a large enough population and there was a lot of industry going on right here. So after a lot of work, they were able to actually get it done with the state. So in 1816, the town of uh, Southbridge was incorporated. And at that time, as you can see, uh, James Madison was president of the country. We had just come off uh, the War of 1812, and it was exciting times for the, uh, for the whole country, as well as our area. So the mission statement, uh, what we intend to do is um, to coordinate the celebration of Southbridge's historical and cultural heritage with an eye on the present while looking forward uh, to the future of our community. Through a year-long celebration, the Southbridge Bicentennial Committee plans to bring a snapshot of achievements and developments of the town. As we plan events, our goals will be for the young and old, generational and new residents to mingle and celebrate with pride our town's 200 years of history in an informational, entertaining and affordable atmosphere. We encourage residents, friends, community groups and neighbors to plan, help, plan, participate and share in our community celebration. And uh, that's really the key. We, we want everyone to be involved. It's not just one small group of people. We need to have everyone involved in this. We need to have all the civic organizations, all the schools, everyone, everyone should have a piece of this because we're all part of it. Now the vision and goals of our little group is um, to inspire our community to shape the future by preserving the past. Uh, the Bicentennial Committee's goals include the celebration of the incorporation of Southbridge 200 years ago, uh, create awareness, civic pride, and community involvement among citizens of all ages to the unique role Southbridge has played in history. Uh, we want to celebrate the various immigrant groups and cultures that have played a role in Southbridge's history over the past 200 years and create lasting memories and legacy projects. One of these projects has already been uh, talked to us, uh, brought to us by Senator Moore. He wanted to send us a copy of the original acts of incorporation for the, the town by, that's held in uh, the archives in Boston. Unfortunately, they're in such a serious state of decay that they need to be restored before they can make a copy of them. And of course, the archives doesn't have the money for that. So that's one of the projects. But anyway, the structure of the uh, Bicentennial Committee will be led by an executive committee consisting of a chairman, vice chairman, secretary, treasurer, and others, and supported by several subcommittees made up of local residents, leaders, and business people. Some of the potential subcommittees include a revenue committee, a participation and recruitment committee, a hospitality committee, a publicity and advertising committee, a special events committee, and a legacy projects committee. The organization of this committee will be based on what was done in 1966 for the Susquecentennial. And for some of you who may remember that, that was a huge group. And uh, there's a book that's available at the library. It's, it's uh, the Susquecentennial book. It's a black book, and it details all of the information about that celebration. And it shows some of the things that were required to make that effort succeed. Um, on the left side of this, pre this slide, you'll see the layout of the original group that was part of the Susquecentennial celebration. There were over 100 people in that committee, all sharing in different goals and different achievements to make the Susquecentennial a success. So 
this kind of commitment will be required for the 200 years for the bicentennial. And those interested, if anyone's interested in joining our little committee, we're going to be having an organizational meeting on Thursday, September 27th at 6.30 p.m. at the Piapi Room in the Jacob Edwards Library. That will probably be the first of many meetings to get everything together and get things moving. So we'll be looking to really formulate the committee at that point. Uh, once the committee is put together and we get everything rolling, uh, we're going to be planning events and celebrations. Uh, some of the events and celebrations we may have, a, a grand parade, a ball, a fire truck parade, a fireman's muster maybe, insurance may be a little bit too much for that, uh, time capsule, antique car and carriage tractor shows, barbecue, talent and variety shows, picnics, arts crafts, cemetery walks, you know, we're looking for anything. What's, what's your idea out there in the public? We're looking for involvement. The other thing we will look to do is to produce souvenirs of the event. A souvenir is a memento of the event, and it also helps to raise funds for the event. And some of the things we will do for that is some of the ideas have been t-shirts, a bicentennial coin, tote bags, lapel pins, insulated beverage cups, calendars, anniversary quilt, commemorative plates, umbrellas, pocket watches. There could be many different things. So once again, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank Madam Chair and the town council, the town manager, Councilor Moriarty, the Historical Society, the Historical Commission for helping us get the thing started but this by no means is the end of it. So once again, those interested in uh, attending the first kickoff organizational meeting of the Bicentennial Committee, or one of its subcommittees, should attend the organizational meeting. And once again, that's at the Piapi Room at the Jacob Edwards Library, Thursday, September 27th at 6.30. And if anyone needs any any information or anyone has any questions, they could feel free to call me. I'm at area code 508. 765-9827. Please call in the evenings. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments at this point? Councilor McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to commend Mr. Moran and Mr. Brady and the rest of the crew there for such fine work that they've done in putting this presentation together and the research that went into it. And I think we're off to a good start already in that you've really shown exceptional leadership and in, in putting this all together. So thank you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anyone else have anything? Nothing? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm okay. looking forward to it. You're really. You're welcome. Thank you. I am old enough to remember the sesquicentennial. <laughs> I still have memorabilia from it. Okay, the next item was a spira, and I guess that's going to be postponed this evening. We're going to move on to our presentation of one of our department heads, and that would be Melinda Ernst Funyer, who is our treasurer collector. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Melinda Ernst von Uren. I'm the treasurer collector for the town of Southbridge. Just a little bit about myself and my history with the town. I've been an, I was an employee in the treasurer's office under John LaFleche from March of 1996 to December 2000. Left for a couple of years, came back in October of 2003, appointed as the treasurer. A few months later, July of 2004, I was appointed the first, the town's first treasurer collector. The first time the position was combined, I was appointed. I'm certified as a Massachusetts municipal treasurer and a Massachusetts municipal collector. The staff that I have in the treasurer's office, I have one full-time employee and a part-time employee. And the collector, we have three full-time. That's besides myself. One of the main functions of the treasurer is the municipal cash manager. 
I'm responsible for the deposit and investment of all town funds. Any funds that come in through any department have to come through the treasurer's office. They get deposited. Everything gets accounted for. The first rule that we use is safety, liquidity, and yield in investing our funds. So we want to make sure it's a safe investment, we can get to our money, and we're earning something. Very little right now, but it's something. There is a legal list of investments that we can invest in, so we can't just invest in anything that we want. We have to follow this legal list. We also invest trust funds. There's some trust funds for scholarships. We have cemetery trust funds. Um, there's a school fund, diff different trust funds that we have. In the treasurer's office, we also accept and deposit all departmental turnovers. We reconcile the bank accounts to the general ledger on a monthly basis, and we have an annual report that gets sent to the Department of Revenue. It's actually submitted today, due at the end of the month. We are also responsible for the disbursement of all town funds. The accountant reviews the bills, they produce a warrant, town manager signs off. In the treasurer's office, we check over all of those vouchers to make sure that it's payable to the right vendor and it's for the right amount. We also check these checks for known delinquents. So if somebody's getting a refund check on an excise tax and we know that they owe excise tax, we will divert that excise tax to something that's past due. Not a current bill, but we will do it to a past due bill. Send a letter to the taxpayer so that they're aware of it. And we mail all the checks, about 7,500 checks per year. I'm also responsible for municipal debt in conjunction with the other finance department members and the town manager. We work with a financial advisor. We do short-term borrowing for mostly small capital items or if we need money prior to doing long-term debt. We also finance long-term debt through my office. Part of the long-term debt is getting a bond rating, which is a, a pretty lengthy process. We have to gather a lot of information. We, we have conversations and sometimes even town visits with the rating agencies, either Moody's or S&P. Our current S&P rating is an A+, plus, which, is, which is good for a small community. I prepare the debt budgets, any debt projections, if there's any projects coming up that we want to project for. And I also have an annual report due to the DOR on our debt. We process in-house payroll. We don't use a payroll service. We use our KVS system that we have. So we do everything from having the time put in to producing checks and doing the tax returns. We see all new hires in my office. There's Many towns that will gather paperwork, the paperwork comes in, the W-4 comes in from the department, but we require every new hire to come into the office to make sure it's a real person and we're seeing this person. We enter and verify all of the town payrolls. Most departments enter their own time, so the police department, they enter the, the regular pay and the overtime pay and the fire department, just about every department enters their own pay. We just, they print it sign it, we verify all of the time and make sure it's going to the right account and the right rates of pay. Departments cannot change the rate of pay, we can only change the rate of pay. The only thing they can do is enter hours. We assist the school department in the processing of the school payroll. They enter their time, they print us reports and that's where it ends. We print the checks, we do all of the tax returns. We print about 10,200 paychecks a year and we also upload direct deposit. We do all of the withholding and dispersing all payroll deductions via checks and wire transfers. We pay the taxes, we pay the union dues, any other health insurance, everything else that comes out. We also process the quarterly annual tax returns and issue all W-2s. We also handle the bulk of the benefits administration for the town and the school department. I participate in obtaining and analyzing quotes for all the benefits in conjunction with the town manager. We administer the health insurance for all employees and retirees. When you work for a municipality, 
the town has to contribute to health insurance. The minimum contribution for an active employee is 50%, and the town is at the 50% contribution. So for a family plan, the town pays and the employee pays $767 a month, and each employee pays an individual would be $295 a month. We also transfer our Medicare-eligible retirees to town-sponsored senior plans at age 65. This is a little different than the private sector because private sector, usually when you retire or you turn 65, you don't have health insurance. We're required to provide health insurance to our retirees as well. I mentioned Medicare-eligible retirees. If somebody started prior to July of 1986, they don't pay Medicare tax. So they're not eligible unless they had another job or have a spouse who had another job. They would not be eligible for Medicare Part B and would have to stay on our active plan. We administer the life insurance for all employees and retirees, dental insurance for active employees. That's a fully employee-sponsored plan. The town does not contribute to the dental plan. We have a 457 plan for our employees. It's similar to our 401k in the private sector, with the exception that there's no town contribution to the 457. We also gather paperwork and set up the deductions for the retirement. Our employees, anybody 20 hours and over, contribute to the pension system. The Southbridge Retirement System or teachers contribute to Mass Teachers Retirement. The Southbridge Retirement System, the retirees contribute anywhere from 5% of their pay to 9% plus 2% of anything over $30,000. So anybody starting now is paying 9% at minimum of their pay into the retirement system. We also have an OBRA plan. Because we're a municipality, we, both, we don't pay Social Security tax. So that when we retire, if you've always worked in the, in the a municipality, you can't collect a Social Security check. We also have a flexible spending account for our employees, which gives us a pre-tax deduction that can be used for health insurance or health-related glasses, dental. And through the Maya program, we have our insurance with Maya. They offer an employee assistance program, so we gather the information and we give out the information, send out periodic newsletters for the EAP. Some of the miscellaneous things we do in the treasurer's office, uh, Southbridge Retirement System, Statutorily, as the treasurer of the town, I'm the treasurer for the retirement system, which is a separate entity. It has its own tax ID number. It's, it's part of the town, but not really part of the town. And I also serve as the town manager's appointment on the board. We administer or keep the postage machine. We do the maintenance buy the supplies and fund the postage machine for all of the town departments here in the building. We do the property and liability insurance. I participate with the town manager in obtaining and analyzing quotes. And in the treasurer's office, we act as a liaison for all claims for town buildings, vehicles, any vehicle claims. Some of the professional liability claims are also done through my office. The only workman's compensation is not. This is the fun part, the tax bills, part everybody's waiting for. In the tax collector's office, we print mail and collect tax bills. Each year, we send out about 5,533 tax bills. Real estate and personal property tax bills are mailed twice per year in June and December, but they're due quarterly. So when you receive a bill at the beginning of July, that bill is due August 1st and November 1st. The bill that's mailed at the end of December is due February 1st and May 1st. If they're not paid by the due date on both real estate and personal property tax, demands are only, demand bills and the fees are only added once per year. So when you don't pay a bill, we add a $10 demand charge and we send you a reminder. On the real estate and personal property, that's only done once a year after the May quarter, after the last payment for the fiscal year. In fiscal 12, we mailed 668 real estate demand bills, which is 12% of the number of parcels. Personal property, there was 104. 
demand bills, 26%. If after demand a real estate bill is not collected, it would, we would start the tax title process. It's not immediate, it's usually about six or eight months after that we would send a reminder letter and then it gets advertised in the newspaper and then it goes into tax title. We actually file an instrument of taking and it gives the town title to that property. So we actually have title and then I'll talk about foreclosure a little bit later on. Personal property, if that's not collected, it's sent off to the deputy collector who tries to help us collect that bill. Water and sewer bills, we mail 17,233 water and sewer bills per year. They're mailed quarterly and due quarterly. They're due at the beginning of September, December, March, and June. Those bills, the demands are usually mailed 10 to 14 days after a due date, but because of the meter program, a lot of people have ex been experiencing higher than normal bills. When you get that new meter, you get like an extra month's usage in there. So we've extended that demand period. We don't do the demands for 30 days. We'll probably f follow through with that for the next, this billing that was just due last week and maybe one more and then we'll go back to the Demand bills that we mailed 4,123, which is 23% of the bills issued got a demand bill. If water and sewer remains unpaid, we add those charges to the real estate bill. So coming up in November or December, anything due prior to July 1st, anything due for the fiscal year 2012 that ended on June 30th would get added to the real estate bill. From there, we do shutoffs. This year, our shutoffs, we did send out 57 no shutoff notices, which was a huge reduction from last year. Once we got last year cleaned all up, its collection has been much better. The other bills that we mail are excise tax, which is for your vehicles. The excise tax file comes from the registry of motor vehicles. So this is any activity that's done at the registry of motor vehicles, if a plate is transferred or uh, an address is changed, could generate an excise tax bill. But it's all based on the information from the registry of motor vehicles. We mail those as commitments are received from the registry, and we mail the demand seven to 10 days after the due date with a $10 fee added. The excise tax bills are not a bill that you wanna let go. After the demand, the demand adds $10, then it goes to the deputy collector with a ten, another $10 collector fee, a $12 deputy fee. If it's still not paid, it's about 21 to 30 days after, the deputy collector will deliver a notice to the last known address and that adds an additional $17. The next step in the process is to mark the license and registration and add another $20 RMV fee. What that does is if you don't pay that bill and your license or your registration is marked, you can't register a vehicle, you can't renew your license. Most other bills, excise tax bills, we do not accept partial payments. You have to pay that bill in full. With all of the bills that I just mentioned, we process a, over 50,000 transactions a year through the collector's office. Failure to receive a bill doesn't invalidate the proceedings for collection. So if you don't get a bill and you know the excise tax comes out every March or is due every March, you need to seek out that bill. Just because you did not receive the bill doesn't mean that you don't have to pay that demand fee or the interest. Almost everything that we do, especially in the collector's office, is it's all governed by Mass General Law. We don't have a lot of flexibility, and I know sometimes there are frustrations when taxpayers come in, but we, we need to follow the law. The law is as it's written. and We also issue refunds of overpayments through the collector's office. We would generate a voucher for the accountant. Real estate and personal property, we would issue a refund after May 1st or upon request. Water and sewer is upon request because there's always gonna be a new water and sewer bill for that property. 
and then they excise refunds because that's a one-time bill. It's not an ongoing bill we issue that. We look at the overpayments every month. One thing on the water and sewer bill, and I, I hear it a lot, it, a lot of people think that the water and sewer bill stays with the property owner, like your electricity bill would. That's not the case. The water and sewer stays with the property, and just because you just bought the, the property doesn't mean that if there was an outstanding water and sewer bill from the prior owner that didn't get paid off in a sale, that doesn't mean that that water and sewer bill gets mailed to the other person. It's the responsibility of the property owner, and it will get added to the tax bill for that property. We also have people who would request that a water bill get mailed to a tenant or a tax bill get sent to a tax service or the mortgage company. And I always try to um, push people away from that because it's your responsibility as a property owner. If your tenant runs up a $10,000 bill, which we have seen, it's going to end up on your tax bill. We also had somebody who didn't know that her mortgage company didn't pay her taxes. So I advertised her in the paper, and that's how she knew that a whole year's worth of taxes hadn't been paid. So I would always say, get your own bill, forward it to yourself, to whoever needs to get that bill. The tax title process. That protects the town's interest in the property. There's only a certain period of time that we have to put the lien on the property before we can't put a lien on the property. We do it every year. The unpaid real estate taxes are advertised in the news. An instrument of taking is filed, which gives us title to the property. We do offer payment agreements, and that's required by law. We have a certain, depending on the balance of the tax title, we have a certain length of time that we would allow a payment agreement. The next step would be a foreclosure. A foreclosure can take six months to several years. I've yet to see any foreclosure take six months. All parties of interest have to be served notice. Right now we have one that was filed in 1994 and 1995 and they're still trying to find the parties in, of interest. This, the owner of the property died in 1927 and now they're tracing, trying. Tax title has priority over most other liens such as a mortgage. Anytime we put a property in tax title, we send notice to mortgage companies because more, more than likely they will pay it because they know that our lien is a higher priority than theirs. Other things that we do in the collector's office, we bill and collect the cell tower and property leases on a monthly basis. There's, I think we collect six different lease payments on that cell tower behind the fire department. It's all subleases through Crown Atlantic. So we bill and collect those. We collect cemetery fees, sewer and water connection fees, septage hauler fees, which is um, some of the sewer services in the area pay to use our sewer department to dump their trucks. We collect betterments, parking tickets, parking permits for a couple of the municipal lots in town, driveway permits, we also issue municipal lien certificates, which shows a snapshot of what's due on a property at a certain period of time. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a lien on the property. What this does is it protects either the borrower or the homeowner. If you're buying a property, you want to see what's owed on that property. And they'll file that at the Registry of Deeds to show that it was clean or that they paid what they needed to pay before a sale went through. We also sign off on permits, so the, mostly the inspections department will have anybody applying for a permit bring the permit to the collector's office to sign off on it to show that the property and the property owner and also um, the contractor is in good standing with the town. We produce a list every November that we give to the department showing anything outstanding over one year old. So they have that list, but it changes every day, so it's, it's tough to keep up with. That's why Nick has them come in to sign off on the permit. I think that's it. Thank you very much. You're Does welcome. anybody have any questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome.
The next agenda item is um, number eight, Citizens Forum. Do we have any citizens who wish to come forward this evening? If you do, state your name and your address, please. Good evening, my name is Helen Lenti, 801 Worcester Street, Southbridge. And I'm here to speak on behalf of something that the chair uh, lady already announced, that there will be a special election in Southbridge concerning Bay Path and the addition renovation project. I've been a member of the uh, Southern Worcester County Regional Vocational School Committee, Bay Path, for nine years. Uh, and in that time, I've seen some uh, remarkable stories come out of that school. Uh, it's a wonderful um, alternative to the traditional education. Uh, students, uh, for the most part, a uh, large majority are going off to college. Some of them are going into um, uh, military. Some of them are going out to a job with a, already a, a large amount of tools supplied by the school with a good background in a trade. But the thing is, the school is over 40 years old, has, hasn't had anything except regular upkeep. Um, this vote that's going to be taken on Thursday, it's a Thursday now, October 4, will be from noontime to 8 p.m. With a special election, uh, you can have specialized voting hours. A simple majority is going to be required to pass the vote. We really hope that it's going to be more than a simple majority. As I say, um, this is a flyer that has been um, probably here in the town hall. There should be some still here now. Um, it talks about the project. It's called Bay Path Rising to Today's Educational Challenges. Bay Path Addition Renovation Building Project. It goes on to explain here uh, what's going to happen, how the school is going to be renovated with some additions onto it too. Very, very long overdue. The um, MSBA, Massachusetts School Building Administration, will reimburse the 10 towns who are participating. 10 towns comprise the Bay Path uh, School District. Uh, we will be reimbursed for 63% of the project, which is a large amount, leaving the remainder of $27,306,000 uh, to the 10 towns. The share for Southbridge, which has the lion's share of students up there, is $3,743,000 over a long period of time. It's a well worth project, well worth putting our tax dollars into. It's hard to know when a deal like this, if I could use that expression, will come around again with the way things are. As I say, I'm speaking here tonight to encourage the people of Southbridge to get out and vote and the people of the nine other towns to get out and vote also and hopefully to vote this project in. I think in particularly in Southbridge's case, we have a brand new high school. It's beautiful, we're very happy about that. We also need to have an improved and new vocational school as an alternative for students to pursue. Hopefully, a lot of people will get out there and vote in favor. And this is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I think the manager has something he wants to add. Just, just Madam Chair, and, and just make sure I have this right, okay. that I think it's important for folks to know that we did have a town election, and the townspeople did pass that here in, in Southbridge. Yes. What that town election actually did, though, was really two components. One was endorsement of the overall project, which that not only had to be approved in Southbridge, but also in the other towns, and yes. it was not. The second part of that ballot was to approve the funding. There was actually, that was actually an override election, a debt exclusion override, to approve the debt exclusion, and that did pass as part of that election. So we have the funding in place for the town of Southbridge to meet the obligation to go forward with this with this project. But I think it's important for people to know that it's not just the one town, because I believe, if, if again, if I have this right, that it's the accumulation of all 10 towns yes. on the vote in regards to whether the project goes forward or not. Exactly. So a significant vote in Southbridge could have ramifications throughout the district, positive ramifications throughout exactly. the district. It will be a simple majority of the total votes of the 10 towns. And I appreciate your uh, explaining that to the people. Um, 
As I say, I'm not a financial wizard. Um, some of these articles that have appeared in the newspaper by um, Stephen Maher and Don McDermott of Auburn, both of Auburn, uh, would want to throw a dead, uh, wet blanket on this project. Very sad. As I say, uh, there's no um, hidden agenda here. Uh, this is the way this, the project is going to come off. It's going to be a very, very good deal and something that we can be proud of for many years to come and not have to worry about it and not to throw any scare tactics at people, but this is also true. If the project is voted down in a few short years, we will be mandated to do major repairs to that building for millions of dollars for which we understand there will be no reimbursement, so the total amount will be on the backs of the taxpayers of 10 towns. This is a very good deal. Hopefully people will come out and realize that and vote for this project. Thank you. Do we have any other? Any other citizens wishing to come forward? Uh, good evening to the town council and uh, citizens of South Bridge. I appreciate the time to address the council tonight. Um, I'd like to start by, uh, oh, sorry, Kevin Buxton, uh, 255 Elm Street. Uh, I'd like to start my uh, comments tonight uh, about uh, a few comments about the cable access television. Uh, I appreciate the fact that over the years, maybe whether famous or infamous, um, a lot of citizens in town recognize me from my uh, uh, comments during Citizens Forum. Uh, the far majority of them uh, appreciate my efforts. And uh, I do my best to um, confront those people who maybe have uh, some negative comments about recycling or our landfill project and clarify some misunderstandings. Uh, and for the most part, I'm considered the guy that's always talking about recycling and not trash, and I appreciate that. Um, I'd l like to compliment the cable access on their new programming uh, on all three channels, 11, 12, and 13. Uh, today I was able to catch a uh, section on uh, a program on Channel 11, and uh, at first I thought it was uh, Bill Gates doing a Microsoft presentation, but it turned out to be our uh, school superintendent doing a very informative uh, project on a big stage with a big screen, uh, looking like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs doing a the latest iPhone release. Uh, I appreciate the fact that the school now has uh, a channel that they can get their programming through. Uh, the government channel uh, is very important to people because not everybody may watch this meeting live, uh, but over the course of weeks between meetings, people usually catch the reruns. And um, I've had a lot of people recently say, oh, I saw you on council. And actually, they saw me during uh, Council of Clements was nice enough to do the uh, recycle information program. And actually, it's been quite a while since I came before council. I'd also appreciate the Channel 13 programming. Uh, it's really good to see citizens involved in producing uh, public broadcasting. Uh, entertaining as well as informative um, and like I said I appreciate all that I'm sorry to see in the recent charter reprogramming uh, that C-SPAN was moved from I can still receive C-SPAN through a cable box but if I have it on my cable ready TV I'm no longer able to receive it 
this close to a national election, I, I really think C-SPAN is an important uh, area. And I realize the council has no control over that. Uh, I'm just merely expressing my concerns and maybe uh, Charter can get it back to a low tier um, station so that cable ready TVs get it. You don't have to have the additional cost of the box. And like I said, I, uh, I thank the cable access and the town for getting the, inf getting the information out of the town council meeting. Um, when we consider open meetings, this is the real open meeting where you don't, you're not sure what the attendance is. Um, you have the attendance of the audience, but you, you're really not sure how many people you're reaching. And I think it's great that uh, we do it. Uh, the, I also appreciate the recent comments by counselors on the quality of not only the program going out, but the quality of program for those people in the audience and yourself who have emphasized that, geez, you know, we might need to work on the sound system because uh, we're not really hearing each other. Uh, it also shows that you two see uh, the benefits of cable access. Uh, in, in recent uh, meetings, there's been some discussion about uh, sidewalks, condition of sidewalks. Um, <clears throat> Councilor uh, Vandal recently made mention of the weed situation with our sidewalks. Uh, personally, I know sidewalks quite well. I don't drive. I do a lot of walking. Uh, not because of... Hold on for one second, please. Sure. And five minutes are up. Does the council wish to give Mr. Case. Buxton another five minutes? Second. Okay. All in favor? Three minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I do a lot of walking. Um, and the condition of the sidewalks uh, get no, gets noticed by pedestrians more than people driving by. Um, as a handicapped person who doesn't drive, uh, I've also had an occasion to walk alongside a handicapped person in a wheelchair. And to somebody who walks, even on a good sidewalk, um, the just, the, the small imperfections that we don't notice, we step over uh, with a handicapped person, it's quite noticeable that they're jostled about their um, seat. Uh, but the recent situation with weeds, uh, I'll agree, it is a problem. Uh, recently, my own house on Elm Street, I really don't have a problem. I have a friend who has about a 125-foot front engine. I recently cleaned up about 25, 30 feet of that um, by pulling the weeds. Uh, within two weeks, the weeds came back because, after all, I just pulled the weeds. As a person with available time, I really should have taken the shot back and removed the dirt the weeds were growing in. Um, I might have gone a step too far and maybe filled in the cracks with cement, but doing that type of work is the DPW could come by and say, thank you very much, you just made this you know, maintenance fee for another 80 years, or they could say, you messed up our sidewalk and now we have to fix it. So it's important for people to understand that um, there, there is a solution and a cost associated with everything. Now, in the past, the solution for weeds on the sidewalk might have been somebody at the town barn takes an old can of gasoline, takes five gallons of gas, mix it with five gallons of water, and spray it out on the streets back in the good old days. Um, nowadays, that's not a practical solution. Um, nowadays, you'd have to go with a, 
approved herbicide, uh, if it's a decision of, let's say, the most common herbicide is Roundup, um, you might say, well, geez, pick up a 55-gallon barrel of Roundup and spray away. Uh, but there's a cost associated with that. And the cost is going to come back. And sometimes maybe what we need is when we're concerned about weeds on the sidewalk, maybe the DPW needs to come forward and say, listen, this is what it would cost us to remove them. Or maybe we could request citizens to, hey, spruce the place up uh, on your own so that we are not adding costs, because that cost sooner or later is going to end up in, in our taxes. Um, and the taxes and service, I mean, every time we have a tax increase, it's always an emphasis. Well, your tax increase is due to the fact that you have a full service town. Uh, and that's a catch-22, if you would, because, you know, if we want these services, we have to pay for them. Uh, which leads me to uh, one service which should not be a cost or a burden to our residents, and that's curbside pickup and recycling. Uh, I apologize, I couldn't stay away from the subject for too long. Well, unfortunately, you kind of waited too long to do so. It's just three minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. I'm saying about the weeds. All right, all right. <laughs> well, um, then uh, as one final comment, Roundup has been linked with uh, the decrease in bumblebee population, so let's not use Roundup either. Let's roll up our sleeves and try to help ourselves before we add more to the tax debt. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buxton. Do we have any other citizens wishing to come forward? My name's John Pulaski. Old Woodstock Road, that's uh, where I live. And I uh, came here to speak about something else, but Mr. Buxton just reminded me of something that I've uh, addressed this council two or three times over the years. I think of it every time I drive down by the bridge that goes up by Dresser Hill. And now that Woodstock Road is cut off, I go by there more often than usual. And it's a simply, and it may be the state, it may be the state's uh, responsibility. I'm not sure. I've heard it was a state, I've heard it's a town. Well, often in government you ask one branch and they'll point at the other as being responsible. There's an area about 50 to 70 feet where there's no sidewalk. And that's worse than having you know, weeds to trip over. Uh, and it's in between what is arguably the most intense retail area in town, Big Y Plaza, and what may be the most uh, intensely populated in terms of people per acre in town, possibly, Brookside Terrace. And uh, not every time, but at least one out of three times, I see someone walking along there, sometimes people with strollers, sometimes with people at strollers at nighttime. I don't think they should be doing it. And they're, they're actually, to avoid going on the, uh, the dirt, they walk along the uh, area that's a highway. And this era of text messaging and cell phones, yeah, people aren't supposed to text message or talk on their cell phone, but let's face it, people do. I think it's an accident waiting to happen. Now, perhaps I, I have found uh, the ladies and gentlemen that are working for the construction company that are removing the uh, bridge on Woodstock Road, they're exceedingly pleasant people to deal with. They like to talk about what they're doing. They've been good neighbors. Perhaps they'd be willing to just, you know, they're making a lot of money. Maybe they'd be willing just to put in a sidewalk, you know, just put in some asphalt. Because there's some ch little piles of asphalt just sitting along the side of uh, the road there that, you know, that could have perhaps taken care of 20% of the need. But it really, I doubt it would cost more than a few thousand dollars. I offered earlier in the spring at a subcommittee meeting just to, Put a, I even bought them, 24 big calendula plants just to have a visual separation so that drivers would notice. But that's not why I'm up here. I just, I think the town has the ability, if it is the state's responsibility, uh, to do something about that. 
look at it, it's on the uh, east side of the bridge. It's only, it's uh, next to where that U.S. solar company is, just in between there. I think it'll make a difference. Uh, a counselor, Nicola, to her credit, seemed concerned about where this spot was the last time I brought this up earlier this year. And if the town can't do it, I mean, I think there's a group of men in this town that would spend some time to just secure it. It's really not that big a, I don't think it'll be a great expense. Now I'm gonna say something that some people on the dais may not like me uh, addressing. It's a problem I became aware of early in the summer, late in the spring, but uh, I'm learning. You know, when I first started coming up here four years ago, you know, I'm not a public speaker. You know, I'm learning, you know, I was too emotional sometimes. I'm, I've learned that the wheels of government don't spin, you know, as fast as we like it to sometimes. So I waited and I waited. There wasn't a Board of Health meeting in July. Often this board will tell us that that, that uh, landfill is the responsibility of the Board of Health. Okay, so they didn't have the meeting in July and that's understandable. You know, people go on vacation, whatever the reasons, we don't need it, you know, perhaps 12 months a year. But I attended the August meeting, as did a few others, and uh, I sat there in anticipation, expecting some action, because this isn't the first time, this isn't an isolated uh, occasion, but our landfill has failed to meet the EPA limits for lead, for arsenic, for chromium, and also for a chemical that I'm embarrassed to say I couldn't memorize it. I wrote it down on an index card and I left it at home. Take my word for it, check it out. I'm sure they'll show you the paperwork. If I was really on my toes, I guess I could have printed the reports up for each and every one of you. But these are all carcinogenic materials and we don't need it in this town. Now, I'm often criticized for only bringing up the bad things. You know, so I'm now throwing, you know, I was Mr. Brady, for example, volunteerism. We got a lot of people in this town, Mr. Moore and there's other people here about to appoint Holly Christo, who's been volunteering for years. Yes, there are good things about this town, but when I come up or Kevin Buxton comes up, we talk about things that aren't perfect. It's not that we're not being loyal to the town. Okay, we want this to be a better town. Yeah, the landfill's here. We can go with a 60-year plan, we can go with a six-year plan, but come on, let's, let's all agree. I don't think any of you up there wants to increase the risks of cancer in our community. Okay, and hold on please, one second. Your yes, five minutes are up. Do if I, I may have, have a just motion? A, one more minute, please. A second. All in favor? Go ahead. As you folks know, I'm very frustrated about this landfill because I've seen it ruin other communities in other parts of the country. I'm not saying it's going to ruin our community. We're ruined the community in South Florida. They have a six inch water table. Fortunately, we, our water table isn't as sensitive to chemicals. Fortunately, that landfill is not contaminating the wells of hundreds or thousands of people as the landfill in Plantation, Florida did. But there's got to be a way of keeping these things in check. For example, we allow contaminated soil in there. I'm not an engineer, but I bet that lead contaminated soil may have something to do with the lead that's showing up in numerous test wells. So my solution goes beyond the town of Southbridge. I believe, like in Florida, we need to have solid wa a solid waste authority at the state level. Because when this was addressed with our Board of Health, they didn't see a problem. It's almost like the EPA doesn't know what they're talking about. They feel they have it in check. I'm not comfortable with it. I believe tens of millions of dollars is needed, not only in Southbridge, but in New Bedford area, something Barney Frank addressed when he announced he wasn't running for re-election. That stench, that smelly landfill out by Ch Chickabee Westover. We need to clean these up. These places have, I'm not kidding you, a million tons, even ours, there's now over a million tons. And it's not just garbage, it includes contaminated soil. So I would ask that we in this town stop at least, at least the contaminated soil, at least the contaminated soil, because it's showing up where it doesn't belong. And it's gonna show up in our bodies. And uh, we don't want that, I assure you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. 
Are there any other citizens wishing to come forward? Do you want to address the sidewalk issue? Yeah, I mean, there's several issues brought up uh, in terms of the sidewalk. We have a uh, active uh, herbicide program going. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that we have to utilize certain um, environmentally friendly herbicides, which are quite frankly not as effective, uh, but we do apply those in an effort to, to keep up with it. On the sidewalk, specifically the sidewalk down by the big Y, that is slated to be done. We are going to do that ourselves, even though it is on state property. We understand that. DPW is trying to get to the, to the list of different things to get accomplished, and we are trying to get some of those things done. And uh, we'll try to find out a timeline for that, because I know we've said in the past that we will do that, but I'll try to get a better timeline for okay. the council. Great. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Okay. Moving along. We have some um, appointments and a couple of votes prior to Councillor's Forum. I'd like to insert, if I might, after the two conf um, appointments, we have nine, ten, and 10A, I received a petition signed by the council and I would like to just place that petition in as agenda item number 10A. Can I have a motion so to do so? And a second, please. Second. And I need a roll call on that, please. Is there any discussion on that before I make uh, yes, Councillor Clements? Sir, I, I guess I have a little bit of a problem with inserting an agenda item because we've had this issue before and adding an agenda item when it's, if it's not of an emergency nature or something of that is, is not um, sanctioned by the AG's office. We're supposed to give prior notice to agenda items that are put on. So well, I do have a problem with it being done that way. I understand that. However, this is a petition signed by all members of the town council requesting that it's included as an agenda item for the next re regular meeting. And as it stands, I mean, I'm, I'm going to entertain a motion that it, it, it is not discussed but goes to um, a subcommittee, but I mean, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, because it, it is addressed to me um, and is signed by the, the nine members of the council, I feel that it does need to go on. Um, I would beg to differ. Okay, that's totally fine. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to this right now, or do you want to vote on it? Councillor McDonald? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm in agreement uh, with Councillor Clements in that, depending on what, I don't know what the time stamp is on the, uh, on the petition, but depending on what it is, and thinking back to the verbiage that's on the website for the Attorney General's office, it says that cannot be reasonably anticipated. And if there was a significant number of hours exceeding 48, I would think that that would be something that would say it was reasonably anticipated. It could have been included in the agenda originally, that it is probably more prudent uh, to wait until the next scheduled meeting of the council, uh, in, in my opinion. And uh, I, I would be opposed to sending it down to the subcommittee because the whole purpose of having this added as agenda items to vote on and it's, it's been vetted, but mm -hmm. that's just my opinion. Thank you, right. Madam Chair. Okay. With that, yes. Just, just to follow up, as the, as the council chair, you have the ability to set the agenda or not set the agenda when, as because I have participated in a uh, request previously in other matters in, in times past. So whether you put it on the 24th or whether in your opinion something goes to subcommittee beyond this, that will be your purview after. The next meeting is the 24th of September, and I still feel that the way this is being done to put on now versus having it done, been done prior to the 48-hour notice, it, it's not, um, I, do, I, would, I would not participate in a vote on such an agenda item being added because we've been told by the Attorney General's office in the past not to add a, um, agenda items unless they are 
very, very serious in nature and have to be handled immediately. So then I will I be requesting it go on to a subcommittee and, be, and from the subcommittee reviewed and vetted as to whether to bring it up for the council. So we'll leave it at that. What point of order, Madam Chair? I believe it's a petition to say to add an agenda item. You cannot then go back and say we're going to talk about this in subcommittee to see if we're going to add this to the agenda because okay. the verbiage in that. Excellent. Then we'll bring it up for the next meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Can I have a removal of the motion and the second, please? Withdrawn by the two members who did make the motion. I okay. made the second. Are you removing the, your motion? I did. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. The motion's been withdrawn. Okay, moving Sorry. right along. Agenda item number nine, vote to confirm the appointment of Martina Shea of Southbridge to the Education and Human Services Subcommittee for a one-year term effective August 1st, 2012 through July 31st, 2013. So moved. Second. Can I have a roll call, please? Council Marcucci? Yes. Council Moriarty? Yes. Council McDonald? Yes. Council Nicola? Yes. Council Pelliquin? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you. Agenda item number 10. Vote to confirm the appointment of Holly Christo of Southbridge to the Education and Human Services Subcommittee for a one-year term effective August 1st, 2012 through July 31st, 2013. So moved. Second. Forgive me, I did not allow for discussion on Martina Shea's vote. Um, is there any discussion on Holly Christo? Okay. Councillor Marcucci. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to um, reiterate, it was a unanimous endorsement from our subcommittee. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can we um, have a roll call, please? Council Moriarty? Yes. Council McDonald? Yes. Council Nicola? Yes. Council Pelliquin? Yes. Council Regis? Yes. Council Vandal? Yes. Council Clements? Yes. Council Langevin? Yes. Council Marcucci? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you. Agenda item number 11, vote to approve the Casella payments of $72,000 from the Recycled Bank Transition Account continue to be used for further education and enforcement for the trash recycling program as outlined in a memo from James Morin dated August 13th, 2012. So moved. Second. Discussion. Councillor McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, just as it was last year, I'm opposed to doing this in this manner. I don't think it's spe specifically uh, the use of the police force in a civil matter, uh, especially when we have some of the other problems that we have in, in town. And so I won't be supporting it based upon on that, as well as my previous stated position on it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other councilors? Councilor Langevin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will be supporting this tonight as written. Um, I think we have made some leeways over the last year and stuff. Is it perfect? No. Um, I, for one, do have concerns about the bylaw, but I am waiting for the bylaw review to come back. I did speak to one of the members on my feelings on that specific bylaw. Um, but I will be supporting this. With that being said, I am gonna say this again and um, just getting the town manager's ear, and I believe I do have his ear on this, that when we do go to the table with Casella for the contract, I really am pushing for that one day a week pickup. If they decide it's on a Wednesday, there should be no trash on the streets Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday night, you put out your trash and that's it. Um, and I'm going to stay on that. So I, I, I hope we do move forward in that. I think that's a, a positive direction for the community. But I will be sworn in this as written. And I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council. Any, any other? Council Moriarty? Uh, just a, I, I stated, oh, here we go. stated this in subcommittee. Uh, I, I still have a number of, of concerns or issues with portions of the bylaw. Uh, while I agree that uh, if we have a bylaw, it should be enforced. Uh, at the same time, I, again, just fundamentally disagree with portions of the, the bylaw uh, and continue to kind of play ping pong in my head on exactly what, uh, how I stand on this. Thank you. That's it? Okay. Any other counselors wish to weigh in on this? No? 
Mr. Buxton. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I appreciate the uh, attention given to the EHS meeting with my concerns. Um, I, I still have continued concerns as far as the um, recycle bank transition fund. Uh, originally, I thought it was established as the recycle reward funds. However, over the years, it has been used for various items. Um, think reduce.com being one. Um, I, don't, I don't really know how more I can emphasize to the council that uh, is it so necessary that these funds are transferred immediately? Um, is there an immediate action that these funds are required for? Uh, I just wish you would take the time to look at the source of the revenue. I realize it's not taxpayer dollars. If it was $72,000 the taxpayer dollars, maybe you'd be a little more hesitant. Uh, and I would also request that as citizens don't know what the memo exactly from Mr. Morin states. And at the EHS meeting, those minutes have not yet been accepted, so I assume the memo will be within the EHS meeting minutes, but until they're accepted, they're not public access. So could I at least request the memo be written? Uh, read? Madam Chair, Go I ahead. happen to have the material in front of me. Uh, it basically is a continuation of the existing program that we have, uh, 36000 for the Solid Waste Enforcement Consultant, 22000 for salaries enforcement related to law enforcement, and then 14000 for edu for uh, educational materials and supplies and advertising uh, to advertise some of the uh, recycling efforts. This really mirrors the money that we spent last year. In terms of timing, uh, we actually appropriated the money um, as part of a revenue source and for the July 1 budget, and this is actually the spending plan. So I would encourage that this has to be voted because we have to spend dollars in accordance with what the spending plan is, and we do currently do not have a spending plan in place. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The, uh, the $36,000 is for the Green Brown and Associate Correct. contract. I'm sorry to say that I was looking forward to seeing a presentation for Green Brown uh, at this meeting. Um, uh, at the last meeting, uh, Madam Chair mm -hmm. said she would try, uh, try to get it done. Uh, there again, uh, we're going with a second round of funding for Green Brown and Associates, yet we still really haven't received information on the first round. Go ahead. Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe that uh, the council received a uh, fairly detailed uh, presentation by the health director that the health director did not produce that information on his own. He actually produced it in concert with the staff, i.e. Green Brown, in this case the consultant. So the information was presented. It wasn't presented by Mr. Jacobson that works for Green, Green Brown. It was presented by Mr. Morin. But the content of that material was produced by Green Brown. So um, I guess I'm a little bit confused and befuddled as to if the information was provided, it was provided by Mr. Morin, who is the overseer of that department, why Mr. Jacobson needs to come in and say what Mr. Morin has already said. Are you speaking of when Mr. Morin came before the council to initiate the contract with Green Brown? That was when the coverage of that contract was presented to the council? Through and you, Madam the Chair. Right. And then this, the, this, you know, we this can't was have we the had dialogue the dialogue here. Through, go ahead. through you. Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Morin came in three or four weeks ago as part of the departmental comments, and he was told by me specifically to incorporate elements of the recycling numbers into his presentation, which he did that night. So it was within the last month or month and a half in which he came in to do that presentation. Final question. The Green Brown contract is for what period of time? Three months? Six months? Is one, it? One year. year. A year. For one year? Mm -hmm. 
I appreciate the council's patience. I just once again request that I don't think this needs to be rushed. I didn't hear what he said. Council McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Based upon what I just heard from our town manager, I need a clarification here. So am I to understand that tonight this vote is intended to extend the contract or renew the contract with Green Brown Consulting? Yes. Okay, follow up to that. Based on that, I think Mr. Buxton raised a very valid point. You cannot count the presentation that was given as an informational purpose from the um, health department director to this council just to give us some background on it as the justification to renew that contract. That should have been done here tonight on this agenda item because there's no indication in this. It says as detailed in the letter uh, that we are renewing this contract. There's been no it, it may have been talked about in subcommittee, but that's not here at this body. You know, recommendations and studies are done in subcommittee. Votes are not. And I think it's highly irregular to do that. And there should have been a presentation saying that that's what we're doing. That's the role of the council is to ratify those, contra uh, those contracts. Um, in your packet, mm -hmm. marked 11, is the... Memo from, I've seen Jim, the men from memo. Jim Morin that breaks down specifically what the $72,000 is for? Madam Chair, I understand that, but there's no contract in that packet. There's no contract attached to this. And if Ma we're going to vote on the renewal and extension of a contract, that contract should be presented before this council, and that presentation should be made by the department head uh, or the person who is requesting the contract. In my opinion, it should be the department head. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, in, in fairness, it, it, it's a, a valid question. Uh, what I will look at is I believe that when the Green-Brown consulting contract was originally adopted that it had an opportunity for extensions, which is fairly traditional. I don't believe it was done for one year. I will double check that though, because if I am in error, then the, the counselor would be right that if it was a one year contract without an extension, we would have to bring the contract back. I do believe that that did have extensions in it. So it would be valid to just fund the extension. So I, I don't see, but let, let me, instead of trying to guess, I, I cannot memorize all the, the contract terms for the various contracts in the town. I will look at the green brown and report back. Okay. Councillor Clements. Thank you. Perhaps it would make it simpler, I and mean, we're looking at 72,000 broken up into three components, 36,000 for solid waste enforcement, and in parentheses it says green brown consulting. But in reality, if I believe the Green Brown Consulting contract was a contract at will, correct? I mean, if, if he wasn't living up to standards or compliance or had issues employee-wise, he could be terminated at any time. If that's being the case or regardless, I look at this as saying 36, and we could amend this so that it's, it's very clear versus as stated in the James Moran you know, memo dated 813, 36,000 in some way, shape, or form going towards solid waste enforcement. Whether that's Green Brown Consulting today and then maybe somebody else tomorrow, that could happen potentially based on his current contract or their current contract, correct? Uh, I mean, that's, I guess, would be a question. And I look at 23,000 salaries and enforcement. Again, that changes, to, it's 22,000 allocated to salaries and enforcement, but it doesn't always mean it's the same officer that we're using currently. That could change. And 14,000 for material supplies and advertising. Again, not explicitly outlined that it's, you know, a five page ad or a one page ad or, or 10,000 flyers. So to me, it's a budget budgeted item we're looking to make sure that we vote on and, and put into place so that we can allocate it towards the efforts that we've started a year ago. So I'm not sure if perhaps we need to change this out in some manner, um, you know, and not have Green Brown as the only listed solid waste enforcement person. I'm not sure if that's feasible, but it would seem like the 72,000 is going, is being broken up into three components and those are the components we're voting on. Whoever is in that position is in that position. I'm not sure if that's, anybody else sees it as that or, in order for this to move forward, if that were the case, if we're, concerned about who our consultant is or who our, our person is. That's just some thoughts. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Clark. Well, Madam Chair, I, I think that there's, in, in all due respect, that we still have, if it was a contract that was only one year and we need to renew it, then we would have to come back. Obviously, the, the charter has a provision in it that contracts have to be ratified by the council. The only thing I'm not clear on tonight as I sit here is I believe what we did was we signed basically a, a, a contract for year to year. 
I believe at the last meeting you did a lease that was year to year for the for the buses yeah. up at the uh, at the DPW facility. It's fairly traditional for us to do year to year. If that is the case and the contract already has that, then we've made it clear that the 36,000 would go to fund the second year of the Green Brown contract. If that was for some reason somewhat different and only a one year contract, if you approve it tonight, then I will have to bring it back to, to council mm -hmm. because then it was a one year contract that on an ad will, at will basis subsequent to that. And then we will correct that. But I just need to look. I, I just need time to, to okay. look at the details of that contract. Well, this is what I suggest. You're going to look. We're going to, we're going to bring this back at the next meeting. And as has been requested repeatedly by Councillor Marcucci, I want the gentleman from Green Brown Consulting and Kim Grant to be present during our presentation um, portion of the town council meeting to give a short version um, of what they're doing. And once we know what the con whether or not it's a contract, it's a one-year contract mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or whatever it is, we will bring this vote to this agenda item, agenda item 11, back. And everybody should be satisfied. Everybody's wishes should be honored. And what I'm looking for now is to have a motion to table this Second. until our next meeting. Second. Okay. Any other further discussion? Did Council, I'm sorry, Councilor Regis, did you want to weigh in on this? No. No. Okay. I did, but everything's been said, and I was just going to make recommend that okay. we pose we postpone. Okay. I agree with Councilor McDonald's comments. Um, I do have a concern regarding the procurement issue part of this, um, okay. the contract. And I'm not comfortable with voting on something pursuant to a memo which states certain things in it mm -hmm. if that's not, in fact, the case that we can do that. So Excellent. Okay. Councillor Pelliquin. Um, I promise I won't try to be redundant to anybody else's comments, but um, I didn't support the Green Brown Consulting contract last year, and I'm not inclined to support it again this year. And um, my concern with it is in terms of um, labor and employment law. Um, and I, I'm kind of familiar with the Massachusetts independent contractor misclassification law. Um, I'm a freelance web designer and I've actually run into problems with this in the past, um, working closely with an entity with their employees as if I was an employee of the organization despite being an independent contractor. And um, you can go online and read at the uh, Attorney General's office as an advisory about this law. And um, Given what this position is and what they do within the health department, I'm concerned that it doesn't totally comply with uh, what's called the three-prong test for what an independent contractor is versus um, an employee. And I'm not sure how this applies to municipalities, and this may be different, but this was a concern that I had had last year. I just had a question. You know, I'm happy to bring staff in uh, to do a presentation, but what does the council want the presentation to consist of? Because I'm going to the manager is confused. I understand that. So am I most days. Um, but I'm going to put that question to Councillor Marcucci. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to the town manager. I believe we had a discussion, Mr. Clark, after um, the last EHS subcommittee meeting. And what I'm referencing is on our weekly reports, which I appreciate by all department heads, I still see there are a number of um, complaints, if you will, or inconsistencies with citizens in the process of the tickets. So all I'm looking for is someone to come here and explain the process to the citizens of Southbridge because there still seems to be a lot of problems. I, I know I see people and they complain that their neighbor didn't get a ticket, but they got a ticket. They came to the town hall. They were issued a citation and a fine. Um, the other person was not. So I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for some compliance and some consistency from Green Brown. Jim Morin did a great job, but I still think uh, someone from Green Brown needs to be here, and maybe even the police officer to say, this is what we do. We go out at this time, um, this is what we look for, 
this is what's cited, and then the process through the town hall and the hearing officer. Thank you. Thank you. That okay. provides additional that material. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have this motion, a second. Any further discussion on, mo on um, tabling it? No? All right. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilor Nicola? Yes. Councilor Pelequin? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clemens? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Councilor Marcucci? Yes. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you. Agenda item number 12. Vote to approve the purchase of two new cruisers fully equipped as detailed memo from Chief Charette and attached quote from MHQ at a price of $37,215. Each. Continue not to put that in there. That's each. Capital expenditure funds of $70,000 are available in the police department budget and the remainder to be taken from motor vehicle repair. The two vehicles in the worst condition, per the chief's, police chief's discretion and paid for with town appropriation funds, are to be auctioned off. So moved. Second. In discussion. Madam Chair. Councillor McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to amend the motion in the following manner uh, to be consistent to what I've discussed in subcommittee. Uh, first of all, to your point, after the number $37,215, add the word each. Continuing down to the bottom of the, uh, the end of the, um, the agenda item, where it says town appropriation funds, comma, are to be strike auctioned off and add the following. Disposed of as surplus property in accordance with section 5-108.1 of the town bylaws and Mass General Law chapter 30B section 15, period. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna have to repeat that slowly for Stacy okay. to be oh, able to write okay, that sure. down. Uh, again, after the uh, Dollar figures thirty-seven thousand, comma two hundred and fifteen dollars. Oh. Add the word each. Not that. The second part. Come okay. On. Well, come I just on. want to make sure. Please. You know. Come on. Disposed of as Silly. Well, you said repeat. I just Please. want to make sure. Please. Move on. Strike the words auctioned off. Disposed of and add the following. Disposed of as surplus property in accordance with section five one zero eight point one. One zero eight point one okay. of the town bylaws yeah. and Mass General Law Chapter thirty B Section fifteen. Chapter thirty B Section fifteen. Section fifteen one five yes. And yeah, I'll second that. That was a second? Yes. Any discussion on the amended? Madam Chair, if I may, um, through you, if I could ask Councilor McDonald a question. What are the minimum thresholds in those sections that you referenced? $500 or $5,000? It's not clear. It just says in the bylaw that that's the procedure to follow. And auctioned off is very vague. And it really should be, a, it, there's several options for disposition for uh, these type of things and it should be done in accordance with what's best appropriate for the town so to lock it in as auctioned off may not be the appropriate thing may be to scrap it too so well, that's what I'm saying if there's no minimum thresholds then there is no pursuant well, to these sections that uh, well I would disagree I mean the, the, the thing is is that it needs to be done in a, the bylaws state it the same way so if the bylaws can be that vague the motion can be that vague we're basically saying that there's a many different ways within those terms it could be disposed of and that's the purpose of citing the mass general law so I think it's specific enough just as the bylaw is does that answer your question council not really but thank you okay councilor Clements um, just so we're clear section 5-108 disposal of surplus property Right. 
So it's pers uh, point one, which you directly reference, it's just three lines, subject to such regulations regarding such disposition as may be promulgated by the town manager, the disposal of surplus personal property shall be governed by the provisions of MGL Chapter 30B, Section 15. Okay. So it doesn't, yeah. And then uh, one to, uh, point two is real property, so he's looking at one. Just, is the town manager comfortable with that? It's, it's been that, a I while guess. since I went for certification. I'm actually going back in a, in a month or so for certification because I, I, I did go through the certification process. But I do believe that, to the counselor's point, uh, that I think that anything under, and I think it's $500, you use kind of best business practices. So you know, we'll we'll do what we'll do what's in accordance with the law. Just last time when I participated in one of these auctions. I mean, these things had to be, you know, taken out on a flatbed. I think we got 200 bucks. So the value of these things is substantially, you know, very minimal because the chief does a good job of literally riding these things into the grave. <laughs> but we'll follow the law. That's fine. That's, you know, what I got certified to do. So I have a, a motion and a second as amended. And y yes, you may. I fully understand that the, re the reason the, uh, the wording is because when, when we seize a vehicle or anything from a, a drug seizure, that kind of thing, the money goes directly back to the police department. As Mr. Clark stated, um, historically, $200, $205. It, it's, it's a relatively small sum of money, uh, but in an effort to keep the best vehicles possible for the officers on the street, I'd like to request <coughs> that we get rid of the worst two vehicles, uh, one of which is a, a drug seizure, and then if, if the council sees fit, however, it should be worded uh, to take that money, then we'd have to go to, by law, we'd have to go to the law enforcement trust, but we could then remove that money from the police budget and go back to the general fund. It's a matter of moving a couple of hundred dollars, but literally the vehicle that we'd be saving is the one that the, uh, uh, the school resource officer is now using, and the other one is, I'd say, just about unusable. Um, so it's, it's just an effort to keep a better vehicle for the officers, and, and the money would go back to the general fund that way, if, if that's all right. Do I have any counselor? I think that the chief presents a very good uh, uh, suggestion. I agree with what he's saying. If we can do it in a manner that gets the best yield for the town, you know, my only concern is that we have a roster of 22 vehicles. If we add two more vehicles without taking any off or disposing of them, we're going to have 24, and we need to get them off the book somehow and uh, get safe vehicles in the hands of the officers. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what you're asking for, Chief, is to have one of them removed? So basically what you were asking me, I know, I'm sorry for the that's okay, that's all right. I'm an English major, I'm used to verbosity. Um, what we'll do is this, that last sentence will read, the two vehicles in the worst condition per the ch police chief's discretion and will scrap and paid for with town appropriation funds because one of those vehicles was actually a drug bust pickup, correct? That's what you want. Okay. And then we'll move on, move on to the disposed of as surplus property, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Very good. All right. So, Tracy, do I, have I complete, Stacy, have I completely confused you? Um, I've confused myself. Maybe I'm the only one in the room who's confused. I Who think knows? I have it. Okay. Could I hear it, please? Sure. Vote to approve the purchase of two new cruisers 
Fully equipped is detailed memo from Chief Charette and attached quote from AMHQ at a price of $37,215 each. Capital expenditure funds of $70,000 are available in the police department budget and the remainder to be taken from motor vehicle repair. The two vehicles in the worst condition per the, chili, per the police chief's discretion are to be disposed of as surplus property in accordance with section 5-108.1 of the town bylaws and Mass General Law chapter 30B section 15. Beautiful, nice job, thank you. Okay, now with that, do I have a motion? We do? We have a second with all of that. Okay. Could I have a roll call, please? Councilor Nicola? Yes. Councilor Pelequin? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Councilor Micucci? Yes. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you. I noticed this. Can I have a copy of this after? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number. 13 is Councilor's Forum. And this evening I'm going to start with Councilor Pelequin. Um, one quick thing. Um, a Spear of Massachusetts will be holding um, their Hispanic Heritage Month celebration on September 21st, 2012. Um, it will be 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Southbridge Hotel and Conference Center. Tickets are $20 at the door or um, you can get them in advance through any of the board members who you can contact. I believe the contact info is um, available on Facebook. Um, you can search a Spear of Massachusetts and there's a Facebook page. Um, and I'd also like to echo, um, Madam Chair, your comments at the beginning of this meeting. Um, Mr. Matteris was my neighbor and a, a longtime friend of the family and we were shocked to hear of his passing over this weekend. Um, reading his obituary in the newspaper this morning, I had no idea he had been a professional baseball player with the Milwaukee Braves, in addition to his um, 20 years of service to the community as a police officer. So I'd just like to extend my condolences and prayers to his family. Uh, we're gonna miss him a lot in our family. So, thank you. And that's all for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Marcucci. I'm all set this evening, thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Regis. Not to be redundant, but um, I would also like to extend my sincere sympathies um, to uh, Greg and Bonnie and their family, um, mine and my family. Um, I knew Mr. Matteris um, uh, and Greg, Bonnie. Um, he was a great man, and um, he will be missed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Council Langevin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't want to repeat this, um, but I have to, because uh, I do believe uh, the Matters family is a very respectful family in the community, and uh, uh, Mr. Matters is going to be definitely missed in this community, so my condolences go out to Greg, Barney, and their family, um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Counselor Vandal? Oh, thank you through you to the town manager. I was wondering when we're gonna see a uh, patrolman on Main Street walk in the beat. I'll talk to the chief in the morning and see if he has any plans to do so. I, I don't have an answer for that right because now. We, I think we were supposed to have now for three years and it seems as though nobody ever sees him down there. And uh, I would like to request that we get the chief up here to talk about all the house break-ins that we've had in Southbridge in the past couple of weeks and kind of warn the citizens of what's going on if they don't read the newspaper or whatever. Would that be possible? It can always happen at the next meeting, though. Reading the paper today, they caught the guy. Pardon? They, reading the newspaper today, the gentleman that, that, that was doing that has been caught. Oh, great. So then it's solved, problem solved. Sounds that way to me. As a matter yeah. of fact, people in the newspaper were we're lauding the police department and doing a great job. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Anything thank you. else? That's it. Okay, Councilor McDonald. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Also echoing uh, my other colleagues up here. 
my condolences to the Matteros family. Uh, Greg and I graduated high school together, and uh, we all know it's already been said how respected the family is and Taki was, and our, my condolences to them. I was wondering if we could also get a copy of the signed uh, petition for the agenda item two in our next packet, please, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have received a couple of uh, inquiries about call firefighter to pay. Uh, that it's, it's been changed from a stipend form to an hourly rate. And I don't recall, if, 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 I, well, first of all, my question would be, is that truly the case? That was part of the budget cycle last year, an integral part of the budget cycle, but yeah. Well, it went into effect on July 1st. Okay. Well, I can understand voting a budget, but I don't recall voting on a policy change. No, it, no there was never oh, yeah. anything that went before this full council that I recall that would do such a change. And, and, and I'll just, this is just the word I receive and from what I know from being up here. Discussing something in subcommittee as a potential lead and then voting on a budget is not the same as changing a policy. A policy is a policy and it's, set and it's established. The other thing I would, this is the concern anyway. The concern that's been expressed to me is that we've made a change in policy that did not get notified to the individuals affected. And I just wanted to clarify that because it was just brought to my attention this weekend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, just, just to clarify, Madam Chair, if, if I may have the opportunity, sure. uh, not only was it done in the budget, budget but your, your point's well taken. Uh, we actually did have a discussion, and in the, I think it's Schedule 1 or Schedule 5, Schedule, schedule 5, five uh, it was uh, basically, I think, almost one separate night in which we talked about Schedule 5, mm -hmm. that that was done in subcommittee, but then that was subsequently also voted specifically by the council to amend Schedule 5, and that one was highlighted because that was a, it was a change. I stand corrected. Thank you. Uh, my last thing, um, Madam Chair, would be uh, I just was curious as to the disposition because one of the things that we had done a few uh, meetings back is procure two new backhoes. And one of the things that was not provided for in that agenda item, as I recall, was the disposition of the faulty backhoe. And I was just wondering what the disposition of that was and when that should be expected to come before us to vote on the disposition of that particular vehicle, seeing as it's so dangerous. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably put together a list of surplus property. Uh, we're going to do that uh, also in conjunction with the school department moving out of their two, well, basically moving out of their two buildings that they have a lot of surplus material. And generally what we do is we don't necessarily advertise individually, we do it collectively. So we will put together that list and, and start on that, on that trail. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have this evening. Okay, thank you. Council Moriarty. I have a couple things and uh, fortunately no fundraising announcements. Uh, one is uh, similar to what everybody else has already noted. Uh, condolences to the Matters family. Uh, Taki was uh, a great individual, lived a couple doors down from my sister. Uh, uh, was one of the first people that uh, we saw uh, when my father passed a couple years ago there, uh, just a few doors down. And uh, just a, a great deal of uh, respect and for that family and, and sympathy. Uh, lastly, I uh, saw in the weekly report, uh, this, this past week's report, uh, a couple firemen in town had delivered a baby safely, a baby girl, uh, on August 27th. I uh, just wanted to kind of let the public know and, and give them uh, a little bit of applause for that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Clements. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to mention I was at the Senior Center today for the luncheon, and um, a lady approached me and mentioned that uh, she wanted to assure me she had cut back her brush off the sidewalks. And uh, she hadn't really noticed how out of control it had gotten and, and she got it taken care of and she was very proud of that fact. And um, if you can be a senior and making sure that you're complying with requests, I, I certainly hope the rest of the homeowners and her property owners will do the same as you've stated before and I've noticed in, in my walks. And a lot of times you don't start to realize when that bush starts to grow out like this from the sidewalk and it, you practically have to cut half of it off. So um, kudos to, to you for making sure your property was taken care of and I do appreciate the feedback on that. It, there wasn't any animosity, there was no anger, there was no, um, boy, you, you know, you told me to do something. It was really uh, pride in the community and in making sure that uh, her property was taken care of for others to walk by. So that was a wonderful thing. And also sympathy to the Matters family. I'm, not personally uh, 
involved with them, but I know how difficult it can be um, with the loss of a loved one, especially a parent, and uh, so certainly our, our sympathies from our family to yours. That's it. Thank you, Counselor. Okay, could we have a um, discussion of the next meeting date is? Monday, September 24th, 2012, 7 o'clock here in Chambers. Okay, great. All right. Agenda item number 15 is vote to enter into executive session according to Mass General Law 39, Section 23B, to review executive session minutes regarding collective bargaining, litigation, purchase, exchange, taking, lease, or value of real property, dis discipline or dismissal brought against an individual, and if matter is concluded, reconvene, vote to release said minutes. And I have a roll call, please. Councilor Paliquin? Yes. Councilor Regis? Yes. Councilor Vandal? Yes. Councilor Clements? Yes. Councilor Langevin? Yes. Councilor Marcucci? Yes. Councilor Moriarty? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councilor Nicola? Yes. Nine yes? Thank you.